let's begin reading here. I'm going to introduce by just reading verse 1. We're going to be reading to, our, actually uh, looking at verses 1 through 20, but I'll begin with verse 1. And I'm going to spend a good portion of our study just looking at verse 1 and then picking up and moving through until we uh, close tonight's study at verse 20. So uh, Solomon begins at uh, verse 1 in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 by saying, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. So he's opening up chapter 7 by letting us know, letting his readers know what makes life better. That word better is a, a word that means something that is esteemed as valuable or something that is excellent. So in the first 10 verses of chapter 7, Solomon is going to use the word better eight times. And so he's wanting us to know what makes life better. And so the very first thing he begins with here in chapter 7, verse 1, the first thing that is better is having a good name. A good name, we all know that as, as having a good reputation, if you will. Now, as we've been going through Ecclesiastes, Solomon has seen what people value. They value novelties. They value worldly wisdom. They value fame. They value having a good time. They, they value unlimited sexual pleasure or luxury homes with gardens and vineyards. They value silver and gold or beautiful music, personal achievements. They value power over people. They value outward religion. And they also value the things that are gained by working hard. And all of these things have one thing in common, and it's one thing in common that he's been pointing out to throughout the several chapters we've already looked at. All of these things have one thing in common, and that is this. They are unsatisfying to the soul. In chapter 6, verse 7, he said, All the labor of man is good for his mouth, and yet the soul is not satisfied. So what could be even remotely better than all the things that someone has gained? Well, he says having a good name, having a good reputation is better. And he makes it clear. He says a good name, verse, seven, uh, verse 1, chapter 7, a good name is better than precious ointment. And so when he says uh, a good name is better than precious ointment, he's saying that a good name is better than expensive luxury items. At that time, precious ointment was greatly valued. It was pleasing to people. It had pleasant fragrance. It was very useful. But he's saying a good reputation is better than having this expensive luxury item. Now, it's something similar to what he had said in what is written, rather, in the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs 22, verse 1, where it says, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. So precious ointment was highly regarded in Israel. Possessing it was an evidence of your financial status. If you had it, it could be a source of financial security against future difficulties. You see, if I found myself in a pinch in a financial crunch, I could sell it, and I'd have money. I could live comfortably. So it was something that was an evidence of my personal value in terms of my financial worth, but it's also a source of security. Precious ointment is something you find in the scriptures that is used uh, normally on special occasions. And I'll give you one example. It's found in John chapter 12, where it speaks uh, there in verses 2 through 5 in this way. It speaks of how they made Jesus, they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. And Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? So it was a valuable item that he's speaking about. A good name, he's saying, is better than precious ointment. Precious ointment was a material thing that people liked. They wanted to possess. It gave them security. And yet he's saying it's better to have a good reputation than than to be financially rich, to be materially rich. Well, why would that be? Well, one obvious reason is, is that rich people don't always have good names. You don't always associate virtue with a wealthy person. 
you don't speak about the goodness of certain people who are very rich. They Very often, you don't think of people who are of great wealth as being also having great virtue. You just don't. And so rich people don't always have good names. And when they die, sometimes there's no one even to speak well of them at their funeral. We saw that in chapter 6, verse 3. And so it's better to have a good reputation. It's interesting how he goes on and says the day of, of death is better than day of one's birth. So he's saying that when you're born, your whole life is before you. There's so many things you can do. There's so many paths that you can and will take. So he's saying, with that in mind, live daily in preparation for the day that you die. Live in a way that secures a good reputation. When your death comes, there'll be many who will have been blessed by you. And that results in people actually saying good things about you at your funeral. I've said this before. I, I think of it when I teach on this particular subject. Um, I, I've said that I want to live in such a way that when my sons or daughters eulogize me, eulogize. The word eulogize is a Greek word. It simply means saying good things or speaking good words. When they eulogize me, I don't want them to lie. I don't want them to come up and say, oh, my dad was this and my dad was that, when in fact I wasn't. I think it's very sad when, when a, a, a son can't say a good thing about the father. So what I've tried to do is I've tried to live a life that would enable my sons and my daughters the day that they come and speak of uh, my going home, which they will, or else they're not getting an inheritance. That's, that's, that's in their living trust. Um, I would never want them to come up and say things about me that weren't, wasn't true. I want them to be able to say, this is the man that I grew up with. This is the man that raised me. And say good things. And that's how you want to live, by the way. You don't want somebody to walk up and say, you know, man, they had the greatest car. And look at his body in, the, in that, in that, in that uh, casket. Look at those biceps. You, you, you really, <laughs> that's not really the thing that you want to hear. Let me share something that's more personal for a moment here. I was taught by my father to seek to have a good reputation. For me, when I grew up, I, I learned this from my father. My father didn't speak much, but when he did, I listened. And he taught me some things that are very important to me to this day. When my father, when I was growing up for my father, his reputation and his integrity were very high in his personal priorities, very high. And he tried to instill honor and integrity in, into me, his son. And at first, obviously, it didn't appear that he succeeded. But after I came to faith in Christ, those things that I, I respected in my father became part of who I am. And my dad taught me some things. My dad taught me to work and to work hard. He, he taught me to live modestly. He taught me to love my wife and to love my kids. My father taught me to have good credit. My father provided a roof and food and clothing, but my father never spent needlessly. My father would pay his bills before he bought groceries. Vacations for us as a family were luxuries. Going out to eat, very occasional. I don't even, I don't even remember my father taking us to anything called a restaurant more than maybe one time in my life. He was so cheap. No, it was, we just didn't. If we were, if we were eating anything, it may be a hamburger, you know, but. We didn't go to restaurants. It, it, that wasn't part of our life. That wasn't part of our diet. My dad didn't spend money on things that he didn't need. My dad didn't spend money on things that were not necessities. My father's credit meant everything to him because his credit was his name. It was his reputation. So he took care of his bills, and he would pay for his bills. He'd pay his bills before he bought us something to eat, and sometimes... We didn't have that much because as I grew up, my mother was ill, and so my father spent a lot of money as I grew up as a little boy. He spent a lot of money on doctor bills. And so he worked two jobs sometimes. My dad was a truck driver, but he also did upholstery on the side. And I can still remember looking out from the window of the house into the garage, seeing my father working late as he was upholstering so he could uh, make some extra money. That was my dad. 
And so when people talk about their luxury vacations and going to the hotels and eating at these special restaurants, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm not saying there is. What I'm saying is I didn't grow up that way. I grew up with a man who was responsible, a man who took care of his family, a man who paid his bills, a man who put food on the table, a man who paid for his house, made sure his house was taken care of, those kinds of things. And he taught me that, and he taught me that my, my reputation was everything. And at the end, when my father went home to be with the Lord, I, I found out that the simple things of life are the most important things to him. Having a good name. For him, respect was expected, but it was also earned. And he lived in such a way that it was retained. And though others may not respect him, he made sure that his family did. And I learned that from my dad. I learned that having a good reputation, having integrity, having, a, having a, this good name is very important. I think every man in this room ought to believe the same thing. That your name, your reputation ought to mean something. Now, me, coming from a Hispanic background, I don't know what it's like in other cultures. Forgive me if it sounds self-serving, but from a Hispanic, my father said, my, we, we would speak about our name in a different way. My mom would say, that's your father's name, and that meant something to me. That's your father's integrity. That's your father's reputation. My mom would say, your father is respected in the neighborhood. Don't do anything to bring dishonor to his name. So this word here, a good name, I, would, I grew up with it. I understand what that means. I understand it's speaking about a man's reputation. It's, it's a, who the man is when he doesn't know somebody's, when he's, it, what, it's what a man is when nobody's watching. Because sometimes people can be something in front of people that they're not by themselves. So a good name is something that doesn't just begin in the outside. It's something that begins in the inside. It's something that you are always, always. And that to me is of high value. Now, I'll go back for a minute when he says in verse 1, the day of one's birth and the day of one's death. Well, when he speaks of that, he's contrasting two things. What he's really contrasting in the way we speak today would be your birth announcement with your obituary. And what happens between the day of your birth and the day of your death, what happens between those two days will determine how you're remembered. If you lived righteously, your day of death is better. Why? Because it reveals that you had a good life. Remember this, that the headstones that you see in the uh, graveyards and all, remember that a headstone has two numbers that, is, that are separated by a hyphen. My dad's is 1927 hyphen 2001. 1927 hyphen 2001. Everything in your life is that hyphen. Everything is that hyphen. From those years, that was you. And he's saying a good man, for a good man, his death announcement will be one that is filled with honor. The things that are said about him will reveal a life that was well spent. And in the end, that is really what I aspire to. You know, the day is going to come, and it's not that long now. Every day is closer that I'll be going home to be with the Lord. It's not a day that I'm afraid of. It's a day I embrace. I look forward to it, to be with him. But every day that I live is one day closer to that day, and I don't fear it. What I want to do is be prepared for it because I don't want people to remember me. I'll say it this way to you. I probably won't say this again until tomorrow. No, I won't say this again. <laughs> But I, uh, I don't want to be remembered for having been a pastor of a, of, a, of a good church. I don't want people to remember me as Pastor David. What I want them to remember me is, is a man who loved his wife. A man, forgive me, a man who loved his children. And a man who loved his grandchildren. I want to be that man, not the pastor. It's just a fact, because people will forget. I've told John this, and he gets bugged when I say it, but it's true. I've said, when day comes, I'll close the door, I'll walk out, I won't be the pastor of this fellowship, God will have somebody else, in, and the people will embrace him, and I'll be forgotten, and that's okay. That's all right. 
because I only had a certain time I was supposed to be there. It's all right. Whoever comes in after, may they love him and serve the Lord with him and all of that. So the people in the church will forget me, but my wife never will. My kids never will. My grandchildren never will. And that's what matters to me. And I want to be remembered as a good man who loved the Lord and was faithful to his God and his family and to his church and to his church. And so a good name is to be desired. The announcement when he's gone will be one that is good. Now he moves on in verse 2 and says, better to, better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for that's the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. So better to go to the house of mourning why is that? Well, funerals remind us that this is the end of all men. We all one day, he's saying, will die. And this knowledge should produce a sobriety in us. There are those who say, well, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. But we're not to do that. Instead, what we do is spend a life preparing for that inevitability. And so it's better to go to the house of mourning. It reminds us of the frailty of our life. Verse 3, sorrow, he says, is better. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance, the heart is made better. And so sorrow has a way of refining our faith. It has a way of removing the garbage we carry around that doesn't matter, lightening that load so that the things that we do embrace and carry are the things that do matter. Sorrow has a way of refining us. It sharpens our vision of eternity. The result is a sober awareness of how brief life can be. And because it is, you prepare. Now, remember that Solomon has grown older, and he has seen many people die, including his own father. So experiencing such deep things has made him much more aware of what really does matter. In Psalm 39, verse 4, Lord, make me to know my end. And what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am? Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Now, obviously, it's more pleasant to laugh and enjoy ourselves, but where do we really learn the best lessons? He says the heart, in verse 4, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. And so, obviously, the deeper lessons we learn come through the times of the sorrow and the difficulty. Remember that when Adam fell, sin entered in, and death because of sin. And the ground that once produced bountifully was cursed. God said, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, in Genesis 3.17. So Adam, you will have toil and you will have grief. The hard toil will produce dissatisfaction with life under a curse. Now earlier in Ecclesiastes 3.11, Solomon said that God has put eternity in our hearts, an awareness of its end. So that produces within us a longing for something greater. It produces in us a longing for someone to help us. So you can have every material thing you desire, but you're empty spiritually. Money's needed, but it can't buy peace and contentment. Ecclesiastes 6.12 says, All the days of our vain lives pass like a shadow. So Christian funerals serve to remind us of that reality. The fear of death that grips our hearts is defeated by faith in Jesus Christ. And the fear is overcome by our knowledge that Christ overcame death on our behalf. In Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, it says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Subject to bondage? I still see people behind counters with their masks on. That trips me out. I want to slap them. <laughs> but they still have their masks on. They still buying into that. 
Even though it's been demonstrated that the masks they're wearing are completely useless, but they're wearing them. Why? Why do they do that? Why are we like sheep? Why do we believe everything that's said to us? What is it? It's because we're trying to preserve ourselves because we're afraid to die. No, I'm not saying go run in front of a car on the freeway right now, you know, and go to heaven. I'm not saying that. Don't tempt the Lord your God. What I'm saying is don't live in fear either. Don't live in fear either. You know, the awareness of, of, of my, my, my one day going home shouldn't be something that I'm frightened about because the fear of death, oh, like Paul said, oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? You know, there is, no, there is no victory. We already have it in Christ. Death doesn't have the victory over us. Jesus already has victory over it. So what I have is eternal life. And I have an appointment, an appointment to see him one day. It's appointed unto men to die once and after this judgment. So I have an appointment. So I don't have to be afraid of it. And the Christian funerals, when you go to one, it reminds you. It reminds you of the shortness of your life. It reminds you. I mean, we, we've had, you know, one of the things, and when we get to chapter 12, it's a chapter I've grown to understand a little bit more because chapter 12 is talking about being an old geezer. And I've grown to understand it a bit more through my experiences in life. I understand much of what he's saying on a personal level now. When you're young, you're going to live forever. You can do anything. You can eat anything. You can stay up late and go to work, you know. And now New Year's, what's that? You know? <laughs> I'm going to stay up late tonight. I'm going to go to bed at 930. <laughs> and so... We do everything when we're young thinking we're going to live forever. But as you grow older, you begin to realize that you should be preparing to meet your maker. And you should be preparing others to meet him too. That's what our ministry is all about, isn't it? And we should encourage people to know the life they can have in Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse 4 and he says, The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. The heart of fools is in the house of mirth. So the truly wise will live with sobriety. They're aware that life is brief. In James 4, verse 14, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? He said, you're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So knowing this has given them the ability to enjoy life as they prepare for eternity. He goes on in verse 5 and says, it is better. It's better to hear the rebuke of the wise then for a man to hear the song of fools, for like the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Solomon compares wise correction with the sound of thorns that are burning. Crackling thorns produce a noise, but they don't produce lasting good. So what is he saying? He's saying, listen, be a person who is able to receive correction. An ability to receive deserved correction will be a blessing to you. And it encourages you in your growth. Proverbs 17.10 says, Rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. If you're wise to listen to correction when it's deserved, it's a good thing for you because you'll be able to grow by it. In verse 7, surely oppression destroys a wise man, re man's reason and a bribe debases the heart. When he speaks of oppression, that's speaking of extortion. So even a wise man's judgment can be clouded when money's involved. In Exodus 23, 8, you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. And so he's saying, be very careful that you, are, you can't be bought. That's integrity once again. In verse 8, the end of a thing is better than its beginning. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. These are proverbs, but each one has a rich kind of meaning to it. When he says the end of the thing is better than its beginning, we don't know the results of something we're doing when we first begin to do it. So we patiently wait for the results, and we'll see that it was something good. You know, the first time I asked Marie, my, my wife, the first time I asked her out on a date, I didn't know what the end would be. I didn't know that she was going to bewitch me with her charm. <laughs> I didn't know what the results were going to be. 
and very often we really don't. So a lot of times what happens is the end is so much better than the beginning. We patiently wait, and as you wait, the results begin to show themselves, and it reveals whether it was good or whether it wasn't good. Now, sometimes that journey is filled with elements that develop our faith and our character, and when we come to its conclusion, we find that we've learned many things. Sometimes you'll start out something with something, and it doesn't seem to be going the way that you wanted it to, and you struggle, and you have tough times, and Sometimes some tears, sometimes some agony, sometimes disappointment. But then you hold on because you know it's what you should be doing and you know it's where you're supposed to be. And then it seems to just straighten itself out sometimes. And then you realize that those afflictions and the things you went through were part of the way that you were growing in your understanding, your love or your faith. And sometimes something seems good at first, but it ends up being anything but good. Again, you never really know if it's good until it concludes or runs its course. When we determine our own path, though, we can suffer eternal consequences. When we reject God's direction and his standards, we reap those consequences. Proverbs 13, 15 says, Good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. So the end would not be better than the beginning for that. But on the other hand, when our ways please the Lord, our lives are blessed. That's because the Lord's hand of blessing is on you all the days of your life. And even during the more difficult times, you know that you're never alone. You know that you're never alone. If there's anything that the Lord wants me to remember always, it's that one thing. Every one of us have different elements in our life that, that God wanted to work on. Certain things within us that that were the key for him to get hold of your heart. For me, it was loneliness. For me, it was loneliness. My mom was the only woman in, the, in our neighborhood who had a job. That's common now. It wasn't common when I grew up. In my neighborhood, all the mamas stayed home. I, only, I was the only one who didn't have a mom at home. And I would come home when I was five and six years old and seven years old. And when I was seven and eight and nine, I'd be taking care of my little sisters when I was nine, 10, 11. And so I grew up in a very lonely environment. I didn't know if anybody ever loved me or cared for me as a kid. I thought that I was abandoned and rejected. So I tried to find relationships. I tried to find love through a woman. And in fact is, is there was no woman alive who could love me as much as I needed to be loved. And that's how come it was easier for Christ to get hold of me because he said, I'm the one who'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you always, always. You know, and one of the words that God gave to me was out of the Gospel of John when Jesus said, I am alone, and yet I'm not alone for you are with me. And those were things that mattered to me. What was it that mattered to you? Those are the things that, that, that give us, I, I think, hope in the end and, and a knowledge of, of what, what, what God's all about and what love actually is. And sometimes we go through things in, in our relationships that make us question whether or not this is a wise choice or should we have. And, but you hold on. And as you hold on, you begin to learn lessons that you would never have learned any other way. And you discover what love truly is and what relationship truly is and what faith in God truly is. But it takes time. But all these things that you go through work together for the good of those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. So we hold on because over a lifetime, we'll see that the Lord was with us through all of our difficulties. In verse 9, he says, do not hasten in your spirit to be angry Anger rests in the bosom of fools. Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. During difficulties, it's easy to get angry at the Lord and to blame him, to blame him for our circumstances. We can lash out. We can live miserable lives. We can be mad at God for everything that's happening around us. He says in verse 10, we can even say it was better in the old days. There are, the, there are those who have come to faith in Christ, and they came out of a you know, bad situation, whatever it may be. They came out of a bad situation. And, uh, and they have a joy when they get saved, but they go through a dry season. And after a while, they begin to think, man, I made a bad choice. You know, what am I doing now? It's Friday night. I used to party on Friday, party on Saturday. 
I don't have any friends anymore. They're all, you know, when I became a Christian, they, they rejected me. So I'm by myself here in the house. I'm lonely. And you can be tempted to think that the days that you had prior to Christ were better than the ones that you're living right now. There are a lot of people who, especially as I remember back in the Jesus movement, were very excited that they were getting, quote, unquote, saved. But after a while, they got bored and they went back to the old life, like the, the pig that went back to the mud, like the dog that went back to the vomit. They went back to those old lives. Why? Because the enemy was whispering and saying to them in their, in their heart, whispering in their ear, if you will, you know, it was better in the old days. You had friends. You had things going on. You had parties. You, you know, and he did that to me. He did that to me. And I had to remember. I had to, I had to consciously remember. It wasn't fun getting so drunk that I vomited all over myself. That was not fun. It wasn't fun getting arrested three times for drunk-related crimes. It, that was not fun. You know, I was in jail, and I'm laying in, on, on the floor, and my best friend is vomiting all over my face. That was not fun. And yet the enemy tells you, oh, it was. It was fun. It was great. Man, you were really living. No, that's why I got saved. Because I didn't want that anymore. Because I didn't like the anger. I didn't like the, I didn't like the alcoholism. I didn't like doing the drugs. I didn't like those things anymore. Those things were killing me. The, uh, about a month and a half before I got saved, I've never been a big person. I've always been a small man. But I, I weighed about 177 pounds. And I went down to 140 in a month because I stopped eating. I, I was only drinking and smoking pot for 30 days. I didn't eat. I'd eat a, an occasional sandwich, and I dropped all this weight. You know, my life was just spinning down, spinning down, one step at a time. One step, I started doing crazy things. I started doing crazy things. I, I, I drank all, about three-quarters of a half gallon of wine and dropped five reds. And anybody who knows what a red is, Lily F40, second all, whatever you call them, downers, they'll kill you. And I almost died. I was in the back seat of my uh, station wagon. Actually, in, I had made it into a bed, and I, was, and I almost died. I felt myself wanting to vomit. And I knew a guy named Freddy Reyes, and Freddy Reyes had died drowning in his own vomit. He had done exactly what I had done. He had dropped a lot of reds and drank wine. It paralyzes you, and you can't move your head. And I was laying on, I still remember, with my laying on my back, beginning to dry heave. And I knew that if I should start to vomit, I couldn't move my head. I was going to drown myself in my own vomit. Those are the good old days, right? Those are the good days. Those are the days you want to go back to, right? Well, that's what he's saying here. He's saying, this, that's, there's no way that we should be saying, why were the former days better than these? Are you kidding me? No, they weren't better. That's why we got saved. What are we to do? Well, I learned to remain as close as I can to the Lord, to trust the Lord, to bring me through whatever it is that I'm experiencing in James 5.11, indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Hold on. It gets better. In verse 11, he says, wisdom is good with an inheritance profitable to those who see the sun. For wisdom is a defense as money is a defense. But the excellence of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to those who have it. So wisdom, he's saying, is better. Uh, why? Well, because money can lose its value through inflation or money can be stolen. It can be lost through poor investments. It could be misplaced. So wisdom is good. It's better, but it's better with an inheritance. Why? Why is that? Why is wisdom better with an inheritance? Because someone can foolishly misuse their inheritance. They can receive something and just go crazy with it. Sometimes these people who win the lottery, quote unquote, when they win the lottery, sometimes these people, because they don't know how to handle money, 
they get worse and they don't get any better. And they get broke very, very quickly. So let me give you some practical advice. Might as well. Why not? We need to remember that we are responsible to steward our finances. Now, as a parent, I'm going to speak as a parent for a moment. As a parent, do your best to train your child to, to, uh, to put the kingdom of God first. Live in such a way that they know you do. I remember on one occasion I spoke to my son Joseph, who was young, a younger boy at that time. And, I, and this is what I'm trying to illustrate it with. I <laughs> say this with, say this as an illustration. I said to him, I said, Joseph, what is it that your father loves? I want to know. Tell me. And don't hold back. Tell me the truth. What is it that your father loves? And I wanted to hear because I wanted to give myself a score, if you will, test myself to see if I was succeeding or not with him. He was in his teens. And I said, Joseph, what do I really love? And he looked at me and he said, you love the Lord. That was what I wanted to hear. That's the best thing you could hear. I didn't want him to say, oh, you love sports, or you love your car, or you love mowing your lawn. or you." I wanted to hear that first. That's how, that's how I live. That's how I, I think we all should live. And so I, I think that it's very important for us to train our children in the things of, of God. As, as you watch them grow, sometimes you'll see that they can be irresponsible with money. So it's a great error to leave a large sum of money to someone who's irresponsible because they're going to go out, maybe buy a car, buy a house, take expensive vacations, buy some clothes, and then just waste the money. So your finances cease being used in the kingdom and your rewards conclude. Remember that your finances continue reaping dividends after you die. In Philippians 4.17, Paul said it like this. He said, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. So don't leave a large amount of money to someone who's going to misuse it. My advice, again, I'm just trying to make this practical at this point. Meet with a financial planner, somebody who's good at it. Develop a strategy. If you're leaving it an inheritance, develop a strategy of dividing that inheritance. Establish sums that each one will get. And if you, if you can, set up a schedule depending on their age and their maturity. I mean, if you have young children and you leave them a, a life insurance policy in the home and all of that, leave them, leave them with a schedule. Have a schedule. Appoint an executor who can follow the orders in your living trust. We set up a living trust for our children when, when my father went home in 2001. I never had had any financial uh, plans at that, at that point. And I realized that because my father died, my father left my mother a house and $10,000 in life insurance. She had to sell the house to live. My father didn't set anything up for, and, and none of the children, none of us wanted any inheritance. We wanted my dad, not what he had. But none of us really received anything either because dad didn't leave anything behind. And so I learned at that time, and I went to a financial planner, and I said, help me set up a living trust, and I want to divide this with my children, and my children are a certain age right now. And so I want it to be set up that they receive things in stages because they're too young at this moment to handle anything I'd leave them. Maybe they'd be tempted to use it for something they didn't need. So make, make those plans. Think it through. And uh, if you're young, it's, it's never too soon to start putting something away. So that one day you may, may have something to leave something behind for somebody else. You're not doing them any favors and your finances cease benefiting the kingdom when you're not responsible. He says in verse 12, wisdom is a defense as money is a defense. So money provides for you in difficult times, but it doesn't buy your way into heaven. Why is that? Well, wisdom is from above. And that's what provides for you here. And that's what gets you there. He says in verse 13, consider the work of God for who can make straight what he has made crooked in the day of prosperity. Be joyful in the day of adversity. Consider surely God has appointed the one as well as the other so that man can find out nothing that will come after him. So consider the work of God. Learn to cooperate with what you have no power to change instead of kicking against God's will. Learn to trust his wisdom 
Verse 14, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the days of adversity, consider. So Solomon is counseling us to be balanced, have an eternal perspective. When our lives are blessed and all goes well, (laughs) rejoice. Be thankful for God's blessings. Enjoy them. Remember, it's God who's blessed you. Be grateful. When we go through hard times, learn through the affliction. Remember that the things you go through are not without good results. So God gives us blessings to keep us happy and burdens to keep us humble. In verse 15, I've seen everything in my days of vanity. There is a just man who perishes in his righteousness. There's a wicked man who prolongs life in his wickedness. Well, that's an interesting thing. I've seen good people die young and scoundrels live long lives. I had to question that one. When my father went home to be with the Lord and I saw other people that just didn't live for Christ and knowing my dad did, and I, had, I wrestled with that. And one day the Lord finally gave me peace by reminding me that he gives people space to repent. And my father was ready to meet Jesus and there are others who don't. And so rather than me saying, how come that scoundrel over there is got all of this, you know, and my dad's a good man. He left my mother with nothing. The Lord says, no, I'm giving them time to repent. Verse 16 says, do not be overly righteous nor overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? That's interesting. He's saying, um, he's, he, he's saying, don't be a hypocrite. He's condemning hypocrisy and the arrogance of the spiritually proud. Um, when he says, don't be overly righteous, that's, that's the hypocrite who is who, who is, is uh, giving the impression that he's more than he really is. And when it speaks of being overly wise, that's the arrogant person who, who, who's always answering. Like if you say something to them, they always have, well, you know what the Bible says. And, and you know that they're just quoting scripture, but they don't know what they're talking about. And sometimes that bothers me when people want to comfort me with words that they're not living themselves. So don't be overly righteous and don't be overly wise. He's condemning hypocrisy. He goes on in verse 17, do not be overly wicked nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? So some people who are wicked live long lives. And just because this is true shouldn't provoke a person to choose to do evil. Just because they live long lives doesn't mean they won't receive justice. So if you're overly wicked, you may do something to shorten your life. So don't live such an evil life that you end up in a premature death. And finally, he goes on. Verse 18, finally, it is good that you grasp this and and also not remove your hand from the other, for he who fears God will escape them all. Wisdom strengthens the wise more than ten rulers of the city, for there is uh, not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. And so there's an internal strength that comes from wisdom. Proverbs 24, 5 says, a wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. It is more important than any other human quality. The strongest people I have ever met, the strongest people I've ever met are not big, powerful, weightlifter type people. They were people with integrity and character. They were people, they were, they were, they were people who knew their God. They were people that I could trust. They were not compromisers. And I, people like me, I, I look for people like that in my life. I, I want them to be a help to me. I, I want to have an example. That's what my pastor Chuck Smith was to me. Is he was an example of someone who who stood strong with the Lord, and, and that's what I think we need. So wisdom strengthens you. It's an internal strength that you have. But it says that ten cities devoid of wisdom are not as needed as one has it. So they may have intelligence and they may be strong. But without wisdom, they're useless. Without wisdom, they're not able to protect the people of the city. And then finally, there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. So that's an obvious thing, but let's close with a couple of scriptures to remind that, us of that. I think it's very important I should say this, and then I'll go on and close. Be very careful that you don't How do I want to put this? Be very careful that you don't trust in man more than God. And what do I mean by that? You already know that. But I've said this before. If you trust me completely, I am sure I'm going to disappoint you. I know I'm going to. Why? Human beings disappoint each other. What's going to keep me from doing that to you? 
And people say, I don't want to go to church because that pastor's a hypocrite. He's, he preaches one thing and he's another. Well, I don't go to church so that I, that I can um, find perfect people. I, I go to church because I know I need help to become a better person. And, and that happens through, through the word and the spirit. And in my life, I've had men that I regarded highly. And the Lord taught me a long time ago to keep my eyes on him. Many years ago, there was a pastor in my life that I appreciated an awful lot. I really did. I won't give his name. It wasn't Pastor Chuck. It was another fellow. And he, he was very, um, to me, and I was a young believer. I was 23. Uh, I was a young believer, 24. And um, I admired him. And I asked a friend of mine to come with me to church because this guy always gave invitations and many people were getting saved. And I wanted my friend to to see what, a, what a, a powerful minister this guy was. And I really had a lot of appreciation for him. And so we went together someplace. He wouldn't come to the church with me, but my pastor at that time, the one I looked at as pastor in my life at that time, was there. And he came up. And I, I hit my friend, and I said, this is the guy that I wanted you to hear. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, he'll see what a great guy he is. And what did he do? He, um, he comes out and he says, there are, there are 50 people who have a $20 bill in your wallet right now. Come and give it to God. And he starts snapping his fingers, telling people to come up and put money in some. And he says, there's 40 of you who have 100. And he's calling out denominations of money they have in their wallet. And I'm just kind of shrinking in the seat. I'm saying, this is crazy. And as I'm doing that, this guy in front of me says, who is this idiot anyway? This guy said, and like, it's my pastor? No, I, I'll never forget that. I'll, and the Lord, the Lord taught me something I've never forgotten. Keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me because man will let you down. I will let you down. I don't want to, but I will because I do. And so... There's none good, no, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's not a single person, even as he says, not a just man on earth who does good and doesn't sin. We know that. Proverbs 20, verse 9, who can say I've made my heart clean? I'm pure for my sin. And so the bottom line is every human being has to deal with that thing. And every one of us needs forgiveness and so Solomon is just making very clear as he's going through these various things that there's one thing that is better, and that's having a relationship with God. That's the best thing that you can have. And with that, we'll stop here, and we'll pick up next time at verse 21.